Again, we are in Romans chapter 11. I am trying to work on in the process of study even after all these many years I continue to try to understand the process of preaching the truth this week on Facebook I had made comment all made comment and I've made comment that there are a lot of preachers that don't preach biblically. And one of the comments coming back, the person says, I would not go to a church where the preacher did preach biblically. And so that spurred me on, and I wrote a blog on, and maybe the Rivers of Joy, wordpress.com, what is biblical preaching? And on the way over today, I told Charity that I might ask our group, what is biblical preaching? What is biblical preaching? And I've said, I've, I've made that comment to me a lot of times here. And I want to preach biblical. And if you will go to that website, and there is a lengthy article on how to discern if the preacher is preaching biblically. How often have I heard people say, man, that was a fun sermon. Or they'll say, man, it sure had a lot of stories. Man, that was a great sermon. And I heard John MacArthur say this last week when talking about preaching, they asked him, when you are at another church, or you're somewhere, how do you how do you handle preachers that don't preach biblically? And how do you keep your mouth shut? And he said, Well, I try to get the right understanding when I'm praying. And there's never a sermon that I hear on radio or television that I'm not asking myself, is this sermon biblical? And it pleases charity when I can go through a whole sermon and not make any comments. <laughs> and another thing you have to understand, you cannot get all of the doc in one sermon cannot get all of the sermon in. Sometimes you do leave certain, certain things out. We are in chapter 11 again today. And we are in the process of trying to understand Paul's argument that he is setting before us setting aside of the Jews the gathering in of the Gentiles into the kingdom of God and therefore you have two olive branches that we're going to perhaps get to this morning the probability the problem that the Jews had became a problem that the Gentiles had. In the text before us, verses 16, or verses 11 through verse 24, and we covered 
uh, 11 through verse 15 last week. Israel's position, Israel's position in the kingdom of God and their danger and ultimate in the kingdom. First, the position of these Gentiles in the kingdom of God. We're going to learn in a few moments. Was grafted in. Grafted in. He grafted them in among the Jews. They had been without God in the world. Prior to this time, they had not been grafted in. They were left outside of the program of God. But now, what a glory was there. They were made partakers of the divine nature. And being saved, changed as heralds of God to carry the salvation to the ends of the world. And truly they had become partakers of the fatness of the olive tree. And so they seemed to be in the place of the broken off branches. And they were built upon the foundation of the apostles. Now, as a brief introduction, verses 11 and 12, the fall of Israel opened the way for the salvation of the Gentiles. The apostles of the Gentiles hold before them the hope of still more abundant blessings when the Jews are gathered in. Verses 13, Romans 11, 13. But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles in as much then I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? The Apostle Paul is establishing two thoughts. He first is established in the fact that Paul is moving to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You understand that the Jews believed that only Jews were going to heaven. And when they rejected the gospel... God set them aside and said, there are still people who need to be saved and I will go to the Gentiles. Of course, this upset Jews quite a bit. And once the Gentiles learned of this, who was not seeking God, but found God, they began to take a different attitude. We come to verse 16 and Paul then breaks in and if the first fruit is holy so is the lump and if the root is holy so are the branches. The first fruit here seems to me to be the believing Israel. Israel of the old days as in Jeremiah 2, 2, 3 it is one perspective that some people believe. Thou wentest after me in the wilderness. Israel was holy, was holiness unto Jehovah, the first fruit of his increase. And the lump to the whole Israel of God, in Galatians chapter 6, that is Israel in God's sight as an always beloved nation. Though now the saved, a remnant according to the election of God, comes out of that nation into a risen heavenly Christ, into a higher calling, when there is neither Jew or Gentile. And as he has been said, the Gentiles is placed upon the root. 
and upon the trunk, not upon the branches. He becomes neither a Jew nor Israel. Blessings, however, has been promised through Abraham and all of the families of the earth. I wanted to establish also, someone else has established with the with the, the verses from the holiness of the, the Jewish first fruits and of the Jewish root, the apostle further argues to the holiness of the lump and the branches. In Romans 11, 16, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. Verse 16 in the New American Standard Version. If the first fruit is holy, the lump also is holy. And Paul makes an analogy based on the Old Testament practice of setting aside the first of one's increase to God. I'm going to think I did. I write some verses down our order. By setting aside the first fruit to God, the entire portion was considered dedicated or set apart. In other words, when you, when a person gave the tenth of the first fruit of his harvest, it meant that 90% also was set apart for the holiness of God. In other words, when they gave the first fruit of all of their blessings, it didn't mean then that they could take the other 90% and do what they wanted to do with it. You first give it to God as a dedication that all of your possessions goes to God. By setting aside the first fruits to God, the entire portion was considered dedicated or set apart. By honoring God with the first increase, God would respond and bless would bless the continuation. When you give to God first, then that which comes later will be blessed as well. And the entire crop was set apart for God's increase. Holiness includes the idea of separation or setting apart. Notice the phrase, if the root is holy, so are the branches. The root <coughs> upholds and sustains the branches. The root sustains and holds the branches. The root of the cultivated olive tree is considered to be holy and therefore so are the branches. So if we have been grafted into the tree, the root of the tree, if we have been grafted into the body of Christ, the body is holy because it's Christ and we've been grafted into it then we become holy. The first fruits and the root and I think in another perspective the first fruits and the root can only apply fully to him who was the real first fruits. In one sense, in the earthly sense, the first fruits was the Jews because they were the first fruits of God's blessings, but the tree itself, the root of the tree, the root out of the dry ground. And so the apostles' argument in this case would be this. If Jesus, the seed of Abraham, and the real root of the true Israelite race, has been such a preeminent blessing to the race. If the root of the tree has been the primary resources of the blessing of Israel, 